Thank you. Why do I get more reaction in Sutu than in English? I don't know, but maybe you don't understand my English. Maybe you understand my vernacular better than my English. I don't know. Go ahead and throw up the scripture on for me, if you don't mind. First John chapter 4. I was promised by the senior pastor that the scripture would be coming. <laughs> Head will we'll roll. Here we go. <clears throat> First John chapter 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're just going to welcome the Holy Spirit as we open up this, this time together. Just pray with me, won't you? Arapaleng. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and I praise you with excitement, with joy that you are here, that you are intending to do a great work in our midst. And in Jesus' name, we bless with anointing all that are involved in the praise and worship, the deacons, the pastors, the ministry teams. In Jesus' name, may the message bring change. Spirit of God, have your way. We surrender everything to you, and we stand before you now ready to praise you, ready to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Chuck. As he was sharing, I sense there's a person really, you're battling with arthritis and you're in pain. So if you have the liberty, we'd like to pray for you even just as we start for the praise and worship. If you have the liberty to come, um, when God gives a word, I've learned what He reveals He wants to heal.
Oh 
As we are just in an atmosphere of worship, um, there was a lady that we baptized last week. If she's here, I'd like her to come forward. And then that young man, they robbed him and shot him. Um, if you'll just come forward, please. Let's just continue. Continue in this worship. quarter to three I had the door banging so I woke up and uh, I went to the door trying to open it so I shout hey please stop let me open it for you so they kicked the door while I was standing there there were three guys at the door one of them was holding the gun he didn't say anything he just shot me and then they took everything which was their money they wanted phones and laptops so they took everything that they could, and then they ran away. I wanted him to share because we need God's protection. Do you have a lot of pain? Yeah, a lot of pain. We came to lay hands on him and trust the Lord. But I want you to know, and I want you to declare, 
It says in Psalm 91, 11, He's given His angels charge over us. When you go to the bed at night, say, thank you, angels. You're on duty. Tell them. You see, we give voice to God's word. Be on duty. Protect me. I want you just to close your eyes. I want you to see the Lord taking the impact of that shot. Father, this young man. We break the fear over him. Lord, we place the anointing oil of your name on that wound. We pray that it will heal in double quick time. But we want to take this pain and place it on you. And Lord, that he will not lose the use of any part of this arm. And as we just agree together, we want to place that pain on you and say, be healed. Thank you, Father. As you were standing here, was the pain very bad? How does it feel now? Uh, it's much better. It's much better. Wonderful. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Let's give the Lord a praise. The Lord bless you. And Lord, I pray that you will protect him. Lord, that he will not allow. And everything the enemy has stolen, we pray that you will give it back to him sevenfold. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. You see, he's our family, and we don't want our family, we don't want you to get hurt. Take a moment and greet one another, and we just want her to share a testimony. So love one another. Last week after the service, um, we baptized a girl. When I say we, it's not one person. We, together as a team. But she had an incredible experience. She's going to just tell us what the experience of this girl was. Because apparently, when I asked her if she was here, she drove all the way from Limpopo to come and be baptized. Yeah, what's, what's actually happened? She's a baby Christian. And uh, she decided to, to get baptized, and she wanted to be baptized in this church. So she traveled from, from Limpopo for that. And she says in the, in the service, as we were doing praise and worship, she asked the Lord, are you here? And uh, she was drawn to the side of the, the church, and she saw the Lord, just the legs bottom. And she was shaking, so she decided, I want to really be baptized. So after the baptism, pastor, after pastor baptized him, she was facing this side. It's, it's as though it was just an electricity force that lifted her, and she faced the other side. And pastor asked, what are you seeing? She never answered. But I could see that something had happened. So when she was changing, I asked her, what did you really see? She started shaking. She said, I can't tell you. I can't put it into words. Then she explained later on. I said, just do it as best as you can. She said, no, she saw the Lord in the service. And again, in the, when she was baptized, she saw the Lord. So she said, she saw the Lord legs down. I said, but how did you know that it was from the legs down? She said, I don't know, but I just knew. And she said, it's huge. He's so big. God is God. Thank you. Wonderful. It's incredible. You see, we have to allow the Lord to do miraculous things and have an expectation. We're going to honor the Lord with that which is entrusted to us. We're going to read two scriptures out of 2 Corinthians 8. And um, I just honor the Lord for you as a congregation that you give. Paul writing to the church in Corinth says, but now you also must complete the doing of it. Um, they contributed to the work of the Lord, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. Then he says, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted. So when you're not willing, it's not accepted. When you have a willing mind, it's accepted according to what one has, not according to what you do not have. Never from this pulpit will anybody make you a promise that's not word-bound. 
The promise I can make you is that God says, I care for you all your needs and I will provide them according to my riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for a willing people that give willingly out of their hearts. We bless them. We pray that in the seed and in the money, in that which they give, there will be every need met. And Lord, even over and above in Jesus' precious name. And if you agree, you just say, Amen. Wonderful. The deacons can stand. Amen. I don't know how you're feeling right now, but I'm feeling really good. And it's an odd thing that we're not on the stage. I mean, he's going to preach there, but just somehow there's a there's an informal feeling here and just allow that the Holy Spirit is doing something. I want to know who here is here for the first time. Raise your hands. Ooh, I'm looking at you in the eyes. Okay. Anybody else? There we go. Over there, too. Okay. Beautiful, lovely people are rushing to you with visitors' cards. Please fill them out. At the end of the service, just out the front door, by the waterfall, there's going to be a table. At the table are going to be lovely other people that have gift bags for those that are visitors. And so we just want to welcome you and thank you for coming and wish you to come again. And so we're, we're grateful that you did come. And we just want you to know that this is a church that is committed to meeting needs. If you need a, an appointment with a pastor, if you need ministry, we have all of that here. So we're all too happy to, to help you. At the end of this service, uh, for those of you who are interested, we have a baby, baby dedication, um, I don't know, class, class yes. Um, I will be taking you through that. If you don't know what baby de dedication is all about, if you're an adult, don't worry, you don't need one. But um, if you're having a baby or do have a baby and you want the baby dedicated, I'm here to talk about that right at the top of the steps in the boardroom. So you can join me there. Amen. While the ashes are taking up the offering, let's just have a look at our uh, other, uh, our other announcements. During the month of May, the Church across Tuane will once again unite in its communication, focusing this year on celebrating one life, loved by God, invited to life, found in the truth, equipped to go. For more info, visit www.wantuane.co.za. Just declare, just declare every tribe and tongue in this room. Begin to release your worship all over this house, my friends. Come on. Feel this house. Feel this house. Come on, louder, louder, louder. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Release a war of the nations. Release a war of the nations. Everyone is invited to our weekly prayer meetings in the chapel hall. Saturday and Wednesday mornings from 6 o'clock and Sunday afternoons from 5. The next business breakfast is on Thursday the 25th of May at 6.30. Neville Norden is the speaker and will talk about financial prophetic oversight in South Africa. There is no cost involved but an offering will be taken up. Bookings close on Tuesday the 23rd of May and can be made online at www.levenavoort.co.za. It's great to be able to share with you this morning. I just am experiencing wonderful things in terms of what the Lord is busy doing. Last week, um, I could take Hoitsi with me and we ministered to a group of pastors that come from uh, different countries in Africa, or French-speaking pastors, and uh, the needs are the same everywhere. But today, in all over Tswane, we're ministering on the concept or the subject loved by God. Now, the question I would like to ask you as, a f as beloveds in the Lord, 
How are you going to reach your friends, your neighbors, your family for the Lord Jesus Christ? Definitely not by telling them what is wrong with them and what they're doing wrong, but by loving them like the Lord loves them. Sunday night passed. I was baptizing an elderly lady. She must be in her early 70s. So because to be baptized at that stage... You see, people had a problem with infant baptism and to be baptized as a grown-up. There's only one type of baptism. It's the baptism of repentance. So the whole family came along, and as they came, I was busy leaving. They just wanted to come and say hello because they'd been here for the first time. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge that there was a lady or that the young daughter, 14 years old, has a stomach problem. She's had that since she can remember. Immediately the Lord touched her. The impact of that on the family is the whole week she's been saying, I've never been without pain. It's gone. It's gone. But early in the evening, as we came in, the Lord showed me somebody was in an accident and they'd been, they were hurting. But the person didn't come out. At the end of the service, the person came out. And when the Lord touched him, he was so overwhelmed because he was in so much pain, a young guy of about 24, and this touched their hearts. Now, she would brought the whole family along, and now God was intervening. The nine-year-old child comes along, and he says, help me, I want to be a new creature. And that's the power of the gospel. So you and I have got to understand that God loves us. Now, he loves us, and then we love our neighbor. He says in Mark 12, verse 31, And the second, the second great command, like it is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I love that it doesn't say instead of yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, to love God and to love your neighbor. Now, love is a four-letter word, and human love and God's love are not the same. Human love can be very selfish, self-centered, egocentric. It's mostly about what can I get out of it. John 3.16 is the love scripture of the Bible. For God so loved the world. I've shared this on many occasions. The Lord had to deal with me. For God so loved Neville. Peter, Susan, who, whatever your name may be, that he gave his only begotten son, that Neville, Peter, Susan, who believes in him, will not perish but have everlasting life. Making that personal. Now this is agapeo, agapeo love. This love is unconditional. This is chosen love. When I say chosen love, God chose to love me. Not because of my gender or because of my skin color. He chose to love me because I'm image of his image. I had to learn, we had a breakaway this weekend of what they call kitten or cat theology and monkey theology. That was quite interesting. I said, what's cat theology? A cat gives birth to little kittens. And then the cat takes the kittens and hides them to protect them. And they say that's what God does. You've got no choice, he takes you. But then the monkey theology is the monkey, when they leave, the little monkey has to jump, jump on the mother's back. So the monkey has a choice. And they say, the schools that say, we have no choice, we're just zombies. I battle with that because I can't go with kitten theology. Adam and Eve had a choice. You've got a choice. And we choose to go with the Lord. You choose to walk in the ways of the Lord. Nobody forces you. This love seeks your highest good. I know that the love of God has no chemistry. You say, Neville, what do you mean? My daughter would come home before she was married with a very handsome guy, and I'd say, wow, that guy's great. And she'd say, Daddy, he doesn't do it for me. 
So um, there was chemistry, and that's good. But God doesn't have chemistry towards us. He loves us regardless. He loves you and me. The chemistry comes from his side. And he says, you are my image bearer. Whoever you are, whatever your gender, whatever your skin color, Act 17, 26 says we made from one blood. He loves us all. That's why it says, for God so loved the world. This love does not need a feeling. God doesn't say, tomorrow I don't feel like loving you. He always loves you. God gave first, and that's unconditional. God gave his best, his first only begotten son, and that's our role model. That's why the firsts are holy. It says in Romans 11 verse 16, an incredible scripture, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. The concept here is that, in the, this is an Old Testament principle from Numbers 15 verse 17 to 21. They had to take the first of the raw flour from the harvest field and bring it as a sacrifice to the Lord throughout all their generations. And all that meant is, first the Lord. You see, remember when Elijah came to this widow and asked her something to eat. There's drought in the land. She says, I've got a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. I'm going to make some food and me and my son are going to eat and die. And then the prophet does something ugly. He says, you can't eat first, give to me. And I thought, that's cruel. But sometimes we're cruel to be kind, to create or to convey a truth. As she said, that's okay, I'll give it to you first. The oil and the flour never got less. God provided. So there's a, a principle that we learn when we look at the word of God in this sense. Now the small group of people praying in your office, and you might be that small group, can have an effect on the whole office. I loved it the other day. A guy came and he said, we used to have parties and wild parties at our office. Then we appointed a girl. He said, and when this girl came in to work, she'd so be so full of joy, we'd all feel guilty. But this girl was praying for us. She says, you know, since this girl's come into our office, the whole atmosphere has changed. We don't party anymore. We spend time around the word. This girl came and changed everything. And that's the effect that we should be having, a change. This applies to a family. One person in a family can change that family in a business, in a community. There's a clip I want to show you of religious Jews. And we're sharing on the ways of the Lord today. But let's look at this clip first. It's incredible. The, it's not that well done because it's just a reproduction. But let's look. On this day that there was supposed to be a ceasefire, that Israel was eight days into the war, there had only been an aerial campaign. And Israel was convinced there was going to be a ceasefire. The Hamas had uh, assured the Egyptians, the Americans, and the Israelis through the Turks and the Qataris that, yes, they were going to accept this ceasefire. A half hour before the ceasefire begins, they open up with a barrage. It was something like 120 rockets that day. I remember that. That was really sleight of hand to take our attention off of what they were going to do yeah. that afternoon. That afternoon, they were going to launch their first terrorist tunnel attack. Several days before, there are a group of religious Jews from Bnei, Ra Bnei Brak, who have a small factory that makes what's called matzah shmurah. Matzah shmurah means literally watched over matzah. It's like the uber kosher matzah for Passover, which has to be watched over from the time the first seeds are planted. They have to be planted according to all the biblical strictures. Mm -hmm. um, they're watched over all during the growing process. Mm -hmm. And uh, every seventh year, the land has to lie fallow. The, the land gets a something went well. wrong. It's a sabbatical They'll try year. and fix it. So this group we'll have a look at it just now. Looking for. Thank you. You know, technology is that's why the end time war will be fought on horses. 
that we, all the technology will fail. But praise God, you know, we, we're still alive and well. Now, what I want to read to you is out of Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 10. And it's interesting how in the Proverbs there's a concept, and I don't know if they can get it on the screen or if something is chucked out completely there. But it says in Proverbs 3 from verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh, strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of your increase. So your bonds will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. 9 verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. If you can't trust God and you can't trust his word, who are you going to trust? Years ago, there was a bank in South Africa called Trust Bank. The more money you put into the bank, the more trust you had. But then the bank lost its trust. They went bankrupt. So not even a banking system assures you anything. You've got to understand how overnight you can lose a fortune. The Word of God wants to teach us. In John 6, Jesus says that he is the Word, the bread of life. And he says, if you don't eat my bread, my body, and drink my blood, you will not have life within yourself. In John 6, 60, it's interesting, therefore, after he said this, Many of the disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Then, in verse 66 to 68, From that time, many of his disciples went back, and they walked with him no more. Now, when you don't understand, yes, a man saying, You've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. But they didn't say how you speak, is this a spiritual understanding or is this with our mental capacity? Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? I want to challenge you to totally put your trust in the Lord in every choice you make regardless of the choice you make. For sure, you need to make intelligent choices. That's why you've got gray stuff between your ears. When I say that, you know, sometimes people are driving along and there's a petrol station, the petrol's low, they say, no, God will provide. You need to put in petrol. You don't need a word from the Lord to know that. The petrol tank says it's empty. So, You've got to understand that God can provide in a supernatural way if you're in a difficult situation. But we've got to trust the Lord. Don't try to be wise in your own eyes. Trust the Lord completely. Trust his word completely. Though you might not always understand it, trust his principles completely. God proved his love for us when he sacrificed his son on our behalf. So you and I can trust him. Proverbs 3, 6. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. His ways are loving ways. Now the question you and I need to ask. For your sin and my sin, God followed the way of love. He gave his son. What way do you follow? Do you follow the way of love in every situation that you make? What are your actions? Then he says he will direct your path. The Hebrew word yashar, in essence God's saying, for his committed servant, he will straighten his or her path. And in this instance, this is the, in the intense form in the Hebrew. Not only will God straighten the person's path, but he will make it the right path. 
You can have a straight road, but it's the wrong road. You've got to know what way to go. What do you do? How do you respond in the situation? I did my first gospel training with YWAM. And there was a woman in YWAM at the time called Rona Peterson. And they caught her for distributing Bibles, sentenced her to death. And she was in prison cell singing, waiting, you know, as the sun comes up. I don't know if you know what it is. I worked for three months at Central Prison when they were still hanging people. At five o'clock, the guys would start singing. And I, it was a terrible, I'm, I'm a young guy and I'm a prison guard. And I hear the guys singing and then all of a sudden, as they get hanged, the singing stops. I ask them when they hang a guy and he falls and he doesn't die, don't they let him go? They said, no. The law says you'll hang on your neck until you die. The one guy they dropped three times. And I thought that was terrible. But here Rona Peterson sitting in prison, waiting. And all of a sudden she says, it's like a man in white clothes. She says, she can't say white, but it was light. Walked. And as he walked through the door, the door just opened. And I remembered Paul and Silas when the chains fell off of them. The prison doors opened. Took her by the hand. The guards were either sleeping or talking to one another. And he walked with her past all the guards, holding her hand, until they got to a place where he left her hand. And she was other side of the border. Didn't say a word. It's interesting that we can enjoy the Lord's protection, and we've got to trust him for that. Not only will God straighten the person's path, but he'll make it the correct path. Isaiah 45 says in verse 2 and 3, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness. I want to, yeah, just keep it on the screen. As you make the path of the Lord your path, He'll give you new inventions. He'll give you new creative ideas and hidden riches in secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. Now you can then put that into history and say that's for Israel. But what about you? What about you? That's why I want you to see the clip just now. I trust they're going to get it right. Now the Lord goes on because he says, you put his kingdom first and then you follow the road of love. And he will bless every endeavor, that which you intend to do, that which you do. Because then I'm working to achieve his kingdom purposes. It's not my kingdom purpose. When that brother came in this morning and he was shot, you know, I just... Something in me, I just thought, you know, Lord, if I could protect him, if I was there, I'd want to jump in front of the bullet. You say, Neville, yeah. I was in Durban and the guys, uh, we went to witness in, a, in an area where there are a lot of gangs. And that night, they closed the door and two of the guys jumped out with pongas and guns and said, the gangs are going to fight it out here. Me and another guy jumped on the stage. When I think back of it, I thought, hey, you should have had your mind read. We jumped on the stage, and I said to this guy with a gun and the ponga, kill me. I know where I'm going. You don't know where you're going. And it's like the fear of God hit that hall. I said to them, now take your guns and take your pongas and put them on the stage. The guy said, I said, I told you, put it on the stage. I can't believe what's come. They put it on their stage. Those gang leaders came and knelt. I was amazed. But the, I could have got killed. But as I get older, I look at this. It's just a tent. But one day we have a building. I don't want to die prematurely. And neither should you. But we needn't live in fear of death. 
Something happens. But it's like I felt when I saw that brother. If I was there, I'd want to jump in front of that bullet. Because I don't want you to get hurt. I want you to know that God loves you. Now, when the Lord says his purpose and his will is always a loving purpose. That's why he says in John 3.16 in the Amplified Bible. I put it in in the Amplified. For God so greatly loved. You not only loved, you are dearly prized. Why? There's only one of your kind in the world. God doesn't make duplicates. Your fingerprints are unique. There's a place in the heart of God that you fill that nobody else can fill. You greatly loved and dearly prized that he even gave up his only begotten unique son. You are unique. You're a unique person so that whoever next to you and you are whoever. For God so loves the whoever's that you would not perish Come to destruction, but have eternal, everlasting life. I wonder, have they got that clip going? They say it's going. Just want you to see that. Sorry that we have to start it over. On this day that there was supposed to be a ceasefire, that Israel was eight days into the war, there had only been an aerial campaign. And Israel was convinced there was going to be a ceasefire. The Hamas had uh, assured the Egyptians, the Americans, and the Israelis through the Turks and the Qataris that yes, they were going to accept this ceasefire. A half hour before the ceasefire begins, they open up with a barrage. It was something like 120 rockets that day. I remember that. That was really sleight of hand to take our attention off of what they were going to do yeah. that afternoon. That afternoon, they were going to launch their first terrorist tunnel attack. Several days before, there are a group of religious Jews from Bnei, Ra Bnei Brak, who have a small factory that makes what's called matzah shmura. Matzah shmura means literally watched over matzah. It's like the uber kosher matzah for Passover, which has to be watched over from the time the first seeds are planted. They have to be planted according to all the biblical strictures. Mm -hmm. um, they're watched over all during the growing process. Mm -hmm. And uh, every seventh year, the land has to lie fallow. The, the land gets a Sabbath as well. It's a sabbatical year. So this group of religious Jews was looking for a large field of very green, unripened, tall wheat that they could harvest immediately and store for two years because next year there won't be any wheat. They look all over Israel. They can't find anything that meets their needs. Finally, down in uh, an area called Otef Azah, which is like the envelope of Gaza, right, right, right on the border. They find acres and acres of a wonderful field, five feet tall, super green wheat, planted according to all the biblical strictures. And they go to the farmers and they say, we want to make a deal to harvest all of it right now. And uh, the farmers said, well, you know, we want to make sure we get the price for it that we would pay in September. And they sure. haggle back and forth and they say, it'll be a good deal for you. You won't have to work these extra two months. No irrigation, right. no upkeep costs. Um, Just the expense of growing it, they won't Yeah, out. and uh, you won't have to sell it piecemeal. We'll take the entire crop. You won't have to sell a little here and a little there. But we must harvest today because every day that goes by, we're losing the ability to store it for two years. We right. want it at its greenest state. We're right now less than 3,000 meters from the border. That's a closed military area. It's the closest we've been yeah. so far You're on the border. Close to Gaza land right now. Yeah. As you can see, this field's been harvested and plowed under already. Two days after they harvest the field, 13 Hamas terrorists pop up from a tunnel right in the middle of the field. In the middle of the field. And if you take a look over here, you'll see not revealing any military secrets, everybody knows it. There's eyes in the sky, there's an observation balloon. Right, it's like a, and I there wasn't are, sure what that was at first. There are cameras all along this area, and there's a unit of female soldiers, all female, all girls, who watch monitors 24 hours a day because boys don't have the same powers of concentration. No, they don't. When they popped up, as they come up out of the tunnel, they do a ninja somersault and then look around going, where the heck's the wheat field? <laughs> this was supposed to be our camouflage. Yeah, it's amazing. Instead of being invisible, they're now visible to everything. They're totally exposed. A 19-year-old girl sees them. She immediately sounds the alarm. 
there's an aerial asset that engages them hits them with a missile we have a special ready response team that engaged them within ninety seconds half the terrorists were killed the other half the terrorists were driven back down into the tunnel and every newspaper account that you'll find will tell you but for those religious Jews who were following biblical strictures we would have had a disaster I was in one I want you to see a principle the Jews do not have the revelation we have of the New Testament but they were following what they knew and the word of God comes in Proverbs 3, 6 and says, In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. You hear the incredible testimony there. Now, two words stand out. We look at the word ways in the Hebrew derek. That's a road of action. This represents or suggests specific opportunities a person may encounter on a reoccurring basis. The concept there is that the Lord says, I want to bring opportunities across your path. Opportunities to do business, new doors for work. I want, if you want my ways, I will show you how to prosper. And I want to do it on a recurring basis. And every day of your life is a new day. And the road of love is always a new opportunity. So trust God in that. Acknowledge God in all your ways on a daily basis. In so doing, he will direct your paths. In equal significance is the word yada, acknowledge or know. Meaning we know his ways by observation. That's why we as parents can't say something to our children that we're not living because they learn by example. And then we know his ways by investigation. Is this the way of the Lord? Is this a pattern? These religious Jews investigated and wanted to do it and they said it must be today. We know it by reflection. I want to reflect. A person says, this is the way, and in my reflection I say, no, that's wrong. I need to follow God's pattern. And then, or by first-hand experience. But the highest level of yada is in direct contact, like in a marriage. In a spiritual sense, it's intimacy with the Lord. When you spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer, the Holy Spirit begins to work with you, and then that births a victory. It births a breakthrough. It births a blessing. How do I do this? So the scripture in Proverbs is saying, there should be intimacy in all your days. In all your days. People come and say, but I don't have much time. You've got time. A little bit, even if it's one scripture, Lord, I just need to be with you. Do you have time to hug your children? Just a little hug. I love being in front, hugging the children. I love it when these little kids come running up and they say, where are you? Just want to give you a hug. And I can go on my knee and just hug these children. There's time for intimacy. You can make time. Then our paths will be made straight and level. There will be fruit for fruitfulness in every area of your life. Our human tendency is accusation. We want to accuse. We want to point the finger. We want to find fault. We want to condemn. We want to uh, speak out condemnation. Or we want to curse. That's the way of the flesh. That's why the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount says, bless those who curse you. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for them. We shouldn't be cursing. We should be blessing. 1 John 4.16, our scripture for the day. And we have known and believed the love of God. That God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love, abides in God, and God in him. So the opposite is true. 
if I'm not abiding in love or in God, I'm not abiding in love. I'm wanting to do it my way. Remember Frank Sinatra used to sing the song, Live my life, done it my way. God's got a way, and I've got to come and say, if my way is not in line with his way, I'm on the wrong way. And then ask yourself the question, do I really know God's love? Do you really know God's love for you? Like the girl that we baptized, I was, she came up out of the water, and we couldn't believe what, how her response was. In this context, I see John the Baptist at the Jordan River. Something of the genuineness of the anointing upon him that the whole Judea and the whole of Jerusalem came out to be baptized. Every year when I'm there, I can't believe how far they walked to come to the Jordan River. But something drew them. It says in Matthew 3 from verse 6, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. Now what did he see? Do you think you can flee the wrath of God that is to come? We've got to know there's a judgment day. There's a heaven and a hell. Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise children of, to Abraham for literally from these stones. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now when your hands are dirty, especially you've been working with oil, you wash them, you can see that they're clean. But what about a dirty heart? What is going on in people's hearts? Especially if you really don't know the person. But true repentance is something that takes place inside. This purification process is not immediately uh, visible. Yeah, John the Baptist is using baptism as a sign of repentance and forgiveness. To repent from something means I'm going in a certain direction, I turn away and I move in another direction. If you can't say I've changed by visible action, have you really changed? These religious leaders, these Pharisees and Sadducees, were keeping the letter of the law, but they were hypocritical. Oh yes, According to the letter of the law, they kept the law, but they did not understand the meaning. John the Baptist did not want to make a request for people to serve the Lord with empty words and empty rituals. You can have an empty ritual. You're doing all kinds of funny things in a religious way, but have you changed inside? He was calling the people to change their lives. And that's the call. The Lord looks deeper than our words. He looks deeper than your religious habits. He judges your words according to the deeds, according to the way you act. Now, if the fruit is rotten, there's something wrong with the tree. Businessman spoke to me this week. You're doing business. A friend of his, friend, Christian friend, or let's say a person he knows well, said, I've got work for you in Natal. So uh, it's a million rands work. The guy gave him three million rands security. And when he didn't pay, he went to claim the security. The guy had given him all his equipment, lorries and stuff for security, but he had everything on lease. He lied to him. So when he goes to see him, he says, hey, you're my brother and you're my friend. I mean, I've lost, you owe me a million rand. The guy threw the paper in the air and he said, so what are you going to do about it? So we live in a world where you don't know what really is going on in the guy's life. 
I heard an interesting thing. Somebody said when you have debt for so long, especially to people that are your friends and loved ones, you have debt, you become, you have no conscience anymore. You see, if I had to explain your conscience, it's like a thing with three corners, a triangle. And each time it gets stuck on a truth, but then when you ignore your conscience, it becomes round. Then it turns around and you have no conscience anymore. And I said to the guy who lost a million, he said, you know, there was something when we did the deal, I didn't have peace. I should have checked. But I just couldn't believe that this Christian brother who is a so-called friend would cheat me and make me lose a million rand. He said, I don't have a lot of money. I've lost all my working capital now. The guy says, what are you going to do about it? Go to the court of law. If he's lucky, he comes on the roller here from now. How you can buy? Go. So be careful. Allow the Lord, like with John the Baptist, I want to discern. Hey, you're a snake. Now I want to say to the men, and really just hear my heart. We men, we're not that bright. So God's given you a woman. You see, they have what we call intuition. My wife will say, don't do business with this guy. This guy's a crook. And I'll say, this guy's a good guy. She says, I tell you, he's a crook. And she was normally right. Interesting. Women just, so I want to say to the men, but sometimes the deal sounds so good. We ignore the wife. Because I mean, I'm the man. I mean, I know. You don't always know. That's why two are better than one. And we've got to learn to listen. So John the Baptist was baptizing people with the outward sign of repentance. Baptism and water can't change you. It's a sign of a change that's taken place in your heart already. Has it taken place? The ashes can dish out the communion. Matthew 3.11 in the Living Bible. With water I baptize those who repent of their sins. But someone else is coming far greater than I. So great that I'm not worthy of carrying his shoes. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now the Amplified says, you will be baptized with, placed in, introduced into the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for sprinkle is rantizo. For baptism is baptizo, to immerse. And uh, to purify by immersion. Literally, if you look at this in front, it's when you take a holder like this, a glass, and you would put it into the liquid and bring it out. That's what baptism is. Baptism is not that. You see, when you get buried, buried, Romans 6 says you get buried. Please don't let them bury you with three pieces of ground on your forehead. Your whole body is still sticking out. So understand the concept of what John the Baptist is trying to say. Now, to illustrate this in John 3.23, when I said, Lord, but um, baptism, you see, it says, now John was also baptizing in an inon near Salem because there was much water there. You don't need much water to sprinkle people, but there was much water there. And they came to be baptized. Now Proverbs 3, 7 and 8 continues and says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Verse 8 says there, It will be health to your nerves in the Amplified and sinews and marrow and moisturing to your bones. Other English translation says, it shall be health to your navel. I said, Lord, I don't understand that. When a baby gets born, through the navel they link to the mother. The mother gives the feeding, the sustenance. So what the Lord is saying, stay linked to me. 
Get from my word sustenance. Get from my word that will build you up. Don't be wise in your own eyes and look for food elsewhere. We encourage mothers to breastfeed as far as possible. Because in your body, you convey to that baby the immune system that you've built up. And that helps that baby to be strengthened and to become strong. Now the Lord says, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fear the Lord. What does that really mean? In Egypt, the midwives were given a command by the king to kill the boys at birth, but the girls could live. It says in Exodus 1.17, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. You say, what's that got to do with us today? How easy do we go for an abortion? A girl came to me two weeks ago, said, I was expecting a baby. I was not married, and I asked you what to do. And you said, don't have an abortion. You've made a mistake, but the baby is not the mistake. The baby has a right to live. She says, I just want to say thank you. You didn't condemn me. There was grace. There was love. I kept the child. He's nine years old. And this child is such a blessing in our home. This child has taught me so much. And every time I look at the child, I remember God's grace. So you see, she can let the child feel guilty. You know, I was stuck with you. It was not the child's choice to be born. But... The mother made the right choice. She wanted to go the way of God. Now the fear of God tells us, do what is right. Love God with your whole being. And it says in Mark 12, verse 30 and 31, and love your neighbor as yourself. I love my neighbor as myself. Then in Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10, we read there, honor the Lord with your possessions. And with the first fruits of your increase. Honor the Lord. Now, I want you to listen carefully. It doesn't say honor me or Chuck. We've got no problem if you want to give us something. But you must first honor the Lord with that which is entrusted to you. So your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will overflow with new wine. That's the principle of the word of God. Honor the Lord is to honor the Lord. Although we fulfill a priestly role, it says in Hebrews 6.20, Jesus is the high priest. We're in the fivefold ministry. He's the forerunner. And he entered, as it were, as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek forever. But we honor the Lord. And as we do that, there's a provision. I'm sitting with one guy and he says, and he told me I couldn't believe what salary he was earning. He said, but I never get through. I said, what do you do with your tithe? He says, I give it to my granny. She's battling. I said, of course you've got scripture for that. Tithe goes to granny. He said, but haven't I got a responsible a responsibility towards my granny? I said, yes, but not with the first fruit. If you honor the Lord, he'll provide for you. He'll turn things for you. You see, there's a way. Now, these religious Jews, what they knew was they had to harvest because the next year would be a Sabbath year. And what did that do? It saved Israel from a lot of trouble that they would have had. He will direct your path. And he will make that path straight and make it the right path. I really want to challenge you. Don't follow your own road. You say, do we always pray for sick? I believe that guy that was just shot, he's going to heal fast. We do because the word says, to them that believe, they will lay hands on the sick. Let's stand together. As you take the bread, it represents the broken body of our Lord. I challenge you to sometimes have communion at home. You see, as often as you partake 
of the bread and of the cup. Do it in remembrance of me. We used to do it at our home on a regular basis and just say to our children, people come and say, but you can't serve a little child. I said, why? I want to teach them the covenant. This is my body broken for you. Let's partake of the bread. The life is in the blood, it says in Leviticus. So when people come and say to me, but don't I have the wrong skin color? I said, nowhere in the word does it say life is in skin color. Life is in the blood. And Acts 17.26 says, we're all made from the same blood. You know, if you're an African and you're sick, and your blood is O positive, you can live from a Chinaman's blood. And he can live from your blood. Because it's the same blood. And it's the same blood that cleanses us from sin. And the Lord says, this is a new covenant in my blood. Let's partake of it. As we conclude the service, if the Lord's spoken to you, and you need to go through the waters of baptism, I don't want to let anybody baptize you and going in a sinner, coming out a dry sinner and coming out a wet sinner. I want you to, to be buried I promise you, we won't keep you under. You know, the one guy says, hold me under for two minutes. I was bad. I said, just now you dry and drown. And how bad are you? If you're worse than that guy, let's hold you under for five minutes. Praise God. If you need to obey, there's a ministry team that would love to minister to you. But let's follow the path and the way of the Lord. He promises he'll make it straight and you'll make it the right path. Let's lift our hands together. Declare with me. Thank you, Father. As I follow your principles and your word, I will be on the right path. And it will be the path that leads to life and provision and sustenance and protection. Thank you, my God. In Jesus' name. Amen. As I was speaking, I see a lady and you've applied for a job. Begin to declare that you're the right person for the job and come and tell us because you'll get the job this week when you go for that interview. The Lord bless you. Let's give him a praise offering. Thank you, Lord. Wonderful. If you need to be baptized, just come in front here. Kubis will be waiting for you and he'll take you to get undressed. We've got baptismal clothes for you, everything ready.